Hi, good evening. It's Thursday night. Um, I'm standing here with Yehuda Leib and Ari Elbem. We're about to do the third uh, lecture of this series. We're doing the three weeks lecture series of 2021, um, as they do every year in a sad time in uh, our calendar. Uh, the current series is called Fundamental Disagreement, the Maimonidean Controversies of the Middle Ages, as you see in the title here. Tonight's lecture is uh, being sponsored, as you see, by Dr. Mars Freeman. Um, in memory of Alex Ray, Zebrain's father who just died the other day. And, and this is, these are the words of uh, Dr. Friedman. A noble, elegant mensch, his Ehrlichkeit humor and good-hearted ways will always inspire all those who knew him. That's actually true. So uh, we do miss him. And, uh, and thank for the, uh, uh, for the uh, sponsorship. Uh, tonight is the third of these uh, lectures. And it's entitled um, Attacking the Live Lion, or as they see in Hebrew, Meshivanis Ori, the first controversies. Or at least I'm going to get up to the first controversies. You know me, I've got too much material. Without any further ado, I'm going to get right down to work. Um, the Rambam was about 39 years old. Now, dates and places actually matter in history. I can't help that. The Rambam was about 39 years old when he finished and published his monumental work, the Mishnah Torah. Up to that point, the Rambam did not work for a living, not in the sense of a 9-to-5 job. He lived off his investments, which were managed by his brother. So you have what he called one of these, these suckers of willing relationships. Here between two siblings. One brother was good for business, the other brother had a head for learning, and that's how they managed it. But then, that worked till he was around 40 years old, 39 years old. But then the brother died on a business trip. He went on a trip to India, and uh, the ship went down, and... Uh, not only did the brother die, but all the money, all the investment money went down with him on the ship. So it was a disaster, um, emotionally and economically. So let's take a look. There's a famous letter the Rambam writes to somebody. Uh, I'll read it in English. Uh, I've suffered many calamities in Egypt, including sickness, financial loss, attempts by informers to have me killed. That's all partial by itself that I'm not going to go into. Uh, but the worst disaster that struck me lately it's a 39-year-old, oh, this is, uh, this is actually, he's writing about eight, nine years later. The worst disaster that struck me lately, worse than anything else I've ever experienced, was the death of my brother who drowned in the Indian Ocean while in possession of much money belonging to me, to him, and to others, leaving a daughter and a widow to support. In other words, the brother was married, and therefore now the Rambam has to take care of the brother's widow and the brother's daughter. Uh, and he says, for about a year after I heard the bad news, I just lay in bed with a severe inflammation, fever, and mental anguish, and I almost died. No, he had a nervous breakdown, okay? He didn't get out of bed. Uh, and totally understandable. I mean, you know, it can, it's a shock beyond shock. I get it. After a year, he pulled himself together, the Rambam did. He recovered. Uh, he had to. And he had to change his lifestyle particularly from the financial point of view. And so that is how Maimonides opened a medical practice. It is strange, perhaps, to start your medical career and open your practice when you're 40 years old, but that's what he did. By the way, I've known some people like that. 20 years before, while living the life of a Muslim, the Rambam had studied with doctors in Morocco. Remember, those days didn't have your four-year medical school program like we have now. But they had their system of education. You hooked up an apprentice with people and things like that. So he had studied medicine with uh, Muslim doctors, um, well-known ones, in Morocco. And he had obviously considered this kind of a career because if when he was young, 20 years old or so and so over, he, he apprenticed, so he studied with, with MDs, he obviously had in mind to become a doctor. I say, you know, when he was 20. But as things turned out, and as we have seen, in his 20s and in his 30s, he had lived the life rather of a Dayan, a Mechaber Sephorim, and he also studied, for fun, natural philosophy and metaphysics. That's what he liked to do, all thanks to his brother, the businessman, who was able to bankroll him. I mean, as I said before, the Rambam had money which was invested with the brother. Now, a medical practice, if you take it seriously, eats up your time, right? His time for... Jewish learning and his uh, speculative, secular studies 
was gone. Now, the studies he had to keep up with were the medical books. Okay? Remember, the guy was a latecomer, and he had to stay on top of the game. And the Ramble will emerge, not overnight, as one of the most famous MDs, a very eminent medical practitioner. You don't do that just like that. He put a lot of time and effort into studying and mastering, and uh, what's the right word, clinical, and, and all the rest of it. And you just had to give a lot of time to your medical practice. I mean, not only the patients, I mean improving the quality of your, of your knowledge. And so, what I'm trying to get across is like this. There's Rambam A and Rambam B. Rambam, of the, of his, when he was in his 40s, 50s, and 60s, he died at 66, was a different person. The Rambam that the yeshiva world knows is the Rambam of the 20s and 30s. Isn't that interesting? Because there are many people, I'm sure, especially in yeshiva, Rambam, Rishon, long ago, the guy in the picture, and so on and so forth. Actually, the Rambam, when he's holding and learning, hawking, writing his peers on the Mishnah, uh, writing the Mishnah Torah, which is an unbelievable work, it was in his 20s and 30s. When he's already more mature in life, that's, that's when he had Z patients all day long. Now, he seems, in his medical practice, to have aimed for a VIP clientele, what they call today Gucci medicine, uh, the Gucci medicine of the 12th century. I'm serious about that. In those days, though, unlike the Gucci medicine of today, the VIPs did not pay for a visit or treatment. But rather, they took care of you in other ways. That's just the, the system in the Islamic world. Unlike the poor, who had to follow the doctor's office hours, and were in an in, in, inferior position vis-a-vis -vis the MD, in the case of the VIPs, the MDs had to be at their beck and call 24-7, with the attitude that the patient is doing the doctor a favor. You know, if the patient is the king, the prime minister, a general, a prince, and so on and so forth, I, the patient, am doing you a favor by letting you treat me. That's the mentality over here. For better or worse, that's the kind of practice that the Rambam chose and pursued. He was successful, but it killed any idea of a daily schedule because you have to be at their beck and call, and they might ask the MD to come look at their friends, relatives, slaves, whatever. He writes in a famous letter, I go to the palace to see one person, then another uh, officer comes over and says, give me a freebie. And then his wife comes over, a girlfriend, and says, give me a freebie, and check out my asthma, and I got a heart rhythm, and by the way, I got a something with a, a ward in my back, and a hundred, and I, I'm walking funny, and my teeth are no good. And since you're dealing with all these high-level high, high level government officials and Arabs, you, you can never say no. And so, you know, you have to uh, cultivate all this. The idea being that when, um, I don't want to say uh, you know, like, uh, Christmas and New Year, but the Muslim equivalent of that, the guy will say you check for 50K. 60k, something like that. That's, that's how these guys operated. You understand? They'll do you some big favor, either a lump sum check or something else, or the guy will, will give you a house. That is how the, system, the culture was in those days. Now, in such a massive, I mean, the money's good, but think about, as I said before, that kind of lifestyle allows for no uh, dafyomi, you know what I'm saying? It allows for no such thing as putting in three, four hours into learning, or three and four hours to study metaphysics, right? You ain't into metaphysics now. You're into, you know, uh, uh, back problems and the, the dental and this and that and the other. And so you don't have the kind of schedule that a highly disciplined person like Maimonides was able to follow for the first four decades of his life, which allowed him to accomplish so much, right? So Torah scholarship was kind of out of the question, and it did not really happen. So what I mean is there are no more books. The first book was the Pirish Mishnah in his 20s. And the second book was the Mishnah Torah. These are works of major Talmudic scholarship. Can I put it that way? Halachic scholarship, and there's nothing else like that. Now, he has letters and shalos and shibas and all the rest of it. <clears throat> so I don't want to give the idea <clears throat> that he you know, totally dropped his Jewish stuff, but much reduced. Okay? And therefore, he can't turn out any more of these literary masterpieces. Um... Uh, on the other hand, and I'm sure this is part of what he figured, being the physician of a big shot Arab, a big shot Muslim, um, that put him in a position to help the Jewish community. Because Jews, historically, especially in the Islamic world, re relied very often on MDs who were Jewish and found favor in the eyes of the, the Caliph, the Sultan, and so forth 
to uh, to treat the Jewish community better. That, that's how it went. If the if your doctor is Jewish and you like him, one of the ways you might show favor to the doctor is by saying, "All right, I won't make this gazera on the Jews." Something like that. So you can be very sure that the guy like the Rambam, when he was a big shot with the officials in Egypt, in Egypt at that time had an empire. It's called the Ayyubid Empire. Saladin, who was the king at that time, you may remember, defeated the Crusaders and reconquered Palestine. And he ruled uh, India and Iraq. So they had a big empire. And uh, the guy, at, uh, one of the guys near the top, now the Rambam was not the doctor of Saladin, which is what they often write that in books, so that's not true. But he was a doctor of the, of the prime minister and later of another king. And the prime minister was Alphadil, and he was a very important person. We'll take it from me. The Qadi Alphadil is a very famous uh, individual, and he ran the uh, bureaucratic side of the empire. And so to have a guy like that as your patient, uh, along with his friends, is very important, and that certainly helped the Jews politically. Okay? So um, it helped put him in a position to help um, the Jewish community and a position to help himself, because these are the years when uh, the past came to haunt him, and Arabs from Morocco heard about this new famous doctor, Maimonides, and they said, hey, he used to be a Muslim back in Morocco, and that means he's high of Mesa, because once you're a Muslim, you can't switch back to being Jewish. Christians have the same law. And they traveled to uh, Egypt to report on him. They told him, and he could have easily gotten killed. But Al-Fadil, the prime minister, um, you know, uh, quashed the, uh, the indictment. You understand? Uh, first, Al-Fadil said it doesn't count because it was forced, and when that didn't uh, last too long, basically Al Fadil had the <laughs> had the file removed. Okay, it's not on the docket. That's how he did business in those days. So um, let's put it this way: the Rambam made himself so well liked by Al Fadil and by the kings and the authorities that the Jewish community was very grateful that they had a guy like this in a high position. And that started a dynasty. The Rambam was the head Jew, the Nagib, the head of the Jewish community, the official head of the Jewish community. And his son took over the job after him, without any fights. And his son took over after him. And his son took over after him. And his son took over after him. So I remember for a long time, it was like a dynasty in the 11, 12, and 1300s, is a Maimonidean dynasty, that each time the son, grandson, great-grandson, and so on and so forth, though, the Rambam, when one died, the son took over, uh, and they all were held in esteem by the Egyptian authorities. So it just goes to show you that the Rambam, who, remember, had spent part of his life as a Muslim, knew the science of handling these guys, uh, and I don't mean anything cynical by that, uh, and uh, was able to use it in a good way. Now, on the other hand, it restricted his time as a dying, I mean, it must have, uh, but he did continue the role there, responsible, cases. So, I'm already showing you a guy that doesn't have any time for anything. Between sitting on basement cases, you know, basements have to deal with uh, marriages and divorces and uh, business deals and uh, inheritance and uh, the mikvah and Shabbos and kashas and who knows what. You know, it's a it's a very demanding kind of position and the Rambo wouldn't take a salary for that. And if you marry that to a medical career, so imagine a guy today, today, who has a real actual genuine medical career, let's say the guy works in a hospital today in, in New York, I'm just making it up. So let's say the guy's a real practice, and he also sits as a dying uh, on the basin of America or something, whatever, I'm just, you know, you know, a real basin. That guy doesn't have too much time for his family, agreed? So, here's a guy with his hands full, um, his time taken up, the medical practice, the, 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 uh, the politic politics of the Jewish community, at this point, in 1185, when he was 47 years old, in the middle of his new lifestyle, which is so demanding, someone shows up in Cairo. Someone from a somewhat similar background, though nowhere near the level stature of Maimonides. This someone, his name was Yosef ben Yehuda ben Shimon. Yosef ben Yehuda ben Shimon. Ibn Shimon. This guy was from Morocco. He too had lived as a Muslim Morano. And he studied medicine. And now he had fled to Egypt to come out of the closet and embrace Judaism. He too was interested in Torah, in math and science, in philosophy and theology. The difference, of course, was this guy was a pygmy, whereas Maimonides was a giant. I mean, you know, he didn't know much. For regular, he was 
educated, but not anywhere in the same universe as the Rambam, but he knew it. Yosef and Yehuda realized this, and he appealed to the Rambam to take him under his wings. Create a curriculum for me, please, and guide me in my studies, both Hebrew and English. I want to know the truth, and I know that you are the only person who knows the truth. Now, this guy was not interested in Lambdas and Iyun, as my mommies had been, because the guy was already 25 years old. He'd been a Murano. Um, he was doing Shiva Bachar. It's not possible to master Shas when you're 25 and you want to just continue with a regular life. There's no time. But well, the other hand, the guy was interested in the philosophical interpretation of the Torah, which of course required an education in metaphysics. Now, metaphysics, in turn, requires an education in mathematics and in logic. These were old subjects that they used to teach in, in classic schools long ago. The Rambam, for example, had written his first book when he was 16 years old on formal logic. I told you, the guy was not normal. No. He didn't write about the uh, Battle of Gettysburg or poetry. He wrote a book, he got his kicks out of writing a book on formal logic. Now, or well, logic terms, actually. So it was a strange relationship from our perspective today. Let's go to the next slide. Imagine a guy goes through our salvation. And he says, I want to learn of you Kantian philosophy. The Rabbi Salvation could teach it. He knew Kantian philosophy. Very few people went to Rabbi Salvation. And why he said, I come to learn of you, you know, classic philosophy. Most of them want to learn Gemara. Agreed? I'll say it again. He knew this stuff. That, you know, your PhD and so forth. And especially Kantian philosophy. You know, he knew it. But that's usually not why somebody comes to, to learn unto you. Now, um, but that's what happened with Maimonides. It's interesting to note that as far as we know, or at least as far as I know, this is the first time anyone came to Maimonides and asked for such a relationship. I mean, the Rambam was 47. He was living in Egypt for you know, 20 years almost. Egypt was not an intellectual center. He dealt with people to ask him Shilas because he's a Dayan. He did belong to some philosophy bull societies, you know, they would get together on Thursday nights and shoot the bull philosophy. Uh, I am. Uh, he did interact maybe with some Jewish intellectuals. Nothing deep that we know. And here's a guy coming, young guy, educated, at least preliminary formal education, an MD in those days. And he said, I want to learn your science side, your philosophy side. It's a little bit like the advisor A. Rottenberg's told me when he went, I don't know, 1960 or something like that, to Ramosha Feinstein and said, I want to learn how to look unto you. And Ramosha Feinstein said, I guess everybody's coming just to learn Gemara. This is wonderful. I've been looking for somebody who's interested in learning Gemara. I want to give it over. And there was a whole group of people at Rottenberg and Ryan Bluth and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, they actually wanted to have this kind of halacha relationship. In the case over here, they're coming to appeal to Rambo, this one guy. So I want to learn all this uh, theology and philosophy your way, okay? Now, the busy Rambam taught, took the time and taught this guy logic, math, and astronomy. So I told him, so I get salvation. He went to learn, I mean, tell somebody in Yeshiva, I want to, uh, uh, what do you call it to you? Time machine. You go back in time machine, you get to learn Chabruza with the Rambam. Whoa! It's with the Rambam. What do you learn? Uh, mathematics. <laughs> it's funny. Now, the prep course for mathematics, I mean, the prep course, for me, prep course for metaphysics, of course, was indeed logic, math, and astronomy, especially logic and math, because you have to think in the logical terms. But then, this guy, Yosef Ben Yehuda, moved to Syria to set up a medical practice in Aleppo. And so he and the Rambam never did get around to actual metaphysics. Notice, he wanted to teach him this stuff. The Rambam said, first, you have to learn the basic stuff. And he learned it with him. And then when time came for graduate stuff, the guy left, and, uh, and therefore he never got around to the actual metaphysics, which we had the juicy stuff, because when you learn the metaphysics, then the idea was that now you'll get the philosophical, true interpretation of the Torah, which is what the guy was interested in. Okay? Now, um, in doing this, uh, the Rambam, who defined... The, uh, one second here. Right. In doing this, the Rambam, who defined the prep course as Meister Bracius, knows he taught him uh, logic, mathematics, astronomy, 
So that's called Maaseh Breshit. Um, if you look in, this is a very controversial one, I'm saying. Uh, and I'll speak about it a little bit more in a, in a few moments. But the, uh, the Gemara, the Mishnah, talks about Maaseh Breshit, but Maaseh Merkava. Uh, literally, it means like this. What exactly happened in six days of creation? I'll tell you exactly. It says, let there be light. The Lord said, let there be man. Let there be water and, the, and grass and so forth. How did that happen? Well, so well, it says, he said, let it be. Yeah, I, I get it. So God spoke, assuming that he spoke in regular way. God said, let there be man. Now, tell me the mechanics of that. It didn't just go boing. There's some mechanics to it. That's the question of Masai Brishis. What exactly happened? Now, you may say, if you're talking about creation, something about nothing, assuming that you have to tell me nothing. So what do you mean, how did it happen? No, I wonder how it happened. How did, fo- uh, how did material come from the immaterial? These kind of questions, okay? Now, um, and then, that's the easy stuff. Then comes Maaseh Merkava, where the prophet Ezekiel saw God riding around on a chariot described in various ways. So then you're already talking about metaphysics, okay? Now, in this case, um, the Rambam was following the Mishnah teaching. There's a very famous Mishnah over here, let's see. Many know it. In Chagiga, it says, of Arayis Mishlosha. You don't discuss matters of Arayis, of uh, laws involving sexuality with a, too large of a class, only three people. And you don't want to uh, discuss Maaseh Breshis. It's so reckoned tight. With a class of uh, two, you want, only want a class of one. When you get to Maaseh Merkava, you don't even teach one. So how do you teach it? Well, if the guy's very smart and can understand a lot, the Gemara says, You give him a few hints and then he has to figure it out on his own. That's what it says in the mission. Okay? So, usually this is understood as mysticism, but the Ram will understand this in metaphysics. And um, it goes on to say, but watch out, call Mestaka Baba Drummond Anybody who looks at four things better than he wasn't born. Malamala, Malamata, Malafim, Malacha. You start to ask what was there before creation, right? What was there after the end of time? You know, those kind of crazy questions. Uh, then you can go off to there. Um, you'll mess it up. But. If you approach it, Chacham, maybe Metaito, with a great deal of wisdom, and you are perceptive, you can figure things on your own, then you can guide through hints. That's the Mishnah teaching. So that's what Ram was doing with this guy. He taught him the Maisabratius part, which is the math, the science, and all the rest of it. Uh, because the Rambam would say physics. I'll give you an example astronomy, learn with an astronomy. So he asked me, where did the planets come from? Well, the first part is to learn how the planets operate. You see? What do you mean by planets? The, the real astronomy, of course, of that century, of that era. Uh, then, after that, you'll talk about the question of how did the planets come to be from nothing. Okay? Now, the Rambam was really fulfilling the dictum that you don't tell to him explicitly, uh, but you give him basic hints. I guess you'd say roads of uh, study. And if the person will then pursue this successfully, he will acquire it on his own, or not. Now, um, take a look at the next one. The Rambam himself, in his Mishnah Torah, which is a text for everybody, says, uh, I'll read the second line, Beer kol elah drum shab When you go through this material, that's in the third and fourth chapter of this part called Helchus Yisuri Torah, which is the very beginning of his law code. And it deals with science of, I'll just use the word physics. Of the as physics was understood in the Middle Ages, you know everything comes from four parts: uh, water, air, fire, and all that. Uh, so all that stuff is considered. Who and Nikra Maaseh That's called Maaseh Breshis. Uh, the Kaksi Rabbanim and the Rabbis teach in Darshan Brabmei Beilu. This is a, a subject Maaseh Breshis that you don't discuss in public. It's only meant for a few a few capable people. You teach to a class of one person, meaning you pick the superior student if the superior student wishes to know it. The inferior student wishes to know it, you don't tell them because they'll screw it up. You understand? They'll mess it up. But the superior student, if he or she wishes to know it, then you can teach them the, 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 the science of that time. What's the difference between as I said before, the Maaseh Breshid and Maaseh Merkava. She'enyin Maaseh Merkava afil echer in Dershavah. 
You can't even tell one student what it is. I told you, it's going to be hint to him. El Gechach may be died to him. Nosal Rosh HaBrakam. The person is very smart and able to perceive on his own. You give him some hints, basics. But he might say, But the science stuff, you can teach it to him, even if he's not that smart. Okay? The law may be so bravi. Why don't you teach it to everybody publicly? She ain't call on him Yeshlo to ask for Chabal Ahasik Perish will be called Ram Mabuyim. The average guy in the public doesn't have the knowledge and the breadth of knowledge and the, uh, shall I say, not knowledge only, but uh, mature thinking to integrate and, and, and uh, synthesize all some material. And they'll misunderstand what you're saying and they'll think wrong things about God. That's more or less where Ram was coming from this, okay? So my point is that he, let's go to the next one. He, next one. He recognizes this. Here's the Pirish Mishnah, where at greater words he says the same thing I just told you. If you look at the second paragraph, you don't teach it even to one person, but you just give him some hints. Who she is over meyasmo. If the person can figure out on his own, and figure it out. If I have to spell it out to you, that's a sign you're an inferior student. If I can just give, give you a few general hints. It's not even expressible. And you can get it on your own, then you're the right student. You see? So, I'm just saying that to the Rambam, if he has a student who wants to know this stuff, it's not so simple. Now, obviously, um, the Rambam and this guy, Yosef and Yehuda, must have clicked on some personal chemistry level. And in addition, the student must have asked many questions about the Torah and about its anthropomorphism, because the Torah is certainly very anthropomorphic. Isn't that true? The upshot of this was the Rambam's decision in his 40s, despite his killer schedule, to set aside some time and undertake the process of Megalin Low Rashi Brooklyn. To give a few ideas out there to the student, trusting that the student will then be able to figure the rest out on his own, and then he'll find the intellectual solace that he is uh, seeking. Can't spell it all out for you, it's too long in any way. I'm not supposed to. Uh, if I have to spell it out, it won't work and, you, and you'll misunderstand it. But if you can understand the basic ways of thinking, I repeat, the ways of thinking about these subjects, then maybe you'll be able to get it. So, um, he started sending him letters on this subject. This is the guy that perplexed, the murder book. That's what it is. Letters he sends to the student. It's prefaced by a letter to the student, all the rest of it. So, it's a bunch of letters sent to the student on discrete areas of uh, philosophy and theology and Torah, uh, with the idea that if the student follows the general mahalach of the thinking, the general line of thinking, he'll be able to be able to put together the puzzle on his own. Okay? It was composed and sent chapter by chapter. Now, in my opinion, I find this very interesting because I think the Rambam is pulled in two directions. After all, you're not supposed to discuss this stuff publicly, and that would imply... You're not supposed to put it down on paper and certainly see it get it published. On the one hand, it should be only written privately for this student, who he says has the necessary background, the right temperament, the right attitude and mind frame. See, basically, you should have told the guy, okay, read this letter and burn it, because I don't want it to fall into any other hands. But that's not what happened at all. On the other hand, clearly the Rambab, who did not, you know, keep this private, the Rambab clearly wanted to share his hashkafas, with qualified readers, by which I mean the secularly educated Jews, who are religious skeptics. They're orthopraxis, as they say nowadays, rather than orthodox. They may follow the practices of traditional Judaism, but they don't hold the beliefs of Judaism. The Rambam felt, in my opinion, that he could get through to these types by showing them that orthodoxy, which means right thought, right? Orthodox thought properly defined in a Muna Tsarufa way, in a rational, purified, uh, theological sense, actually was not what the masses usually take it to be, it's something else. The way to do this was to share the intellectual rigor of his own thinking, so that the skeptics would not think that Judaism relies on frumi books you buy at Chopsies, but rather on scientific Argument and proof. I'm trying to share with you, as best they understand, the mindset of Maimonides. That's how he saw it. He figured he had the scientific way of approaching the subject. The arguments that he had studied and constructed and all that were the arguments. 
and they would be uh, persuasive to someone who is capable of high thought. Indeed, the Rambam states explicitly, let's look at the next one, in his book about the guy for every place, he said, it's not for you guys. It's not my intention in this book, to teach it to the masses. And not to guys who are just at the beginning of their studies, like say the high school. This is not for high school students. It's certainly not for the uh, uh, readership of people whose only knowledge is the Gemara. Not for Yeshiva guys. They don't get it. When he says it's not for them, he means like this. You'll mess it up. It'll hurt you. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Really, it's good, but you have to be in a certain state of mind with a certain level of education, including a certain amount of secular education, by which I'm, he means the math and science stuff. Uh, and if you don't have it, you'll not only, first of all, it won't interest you, and if it interests you, you'll misinterpret it and it'll hurt you. Okay. Um, nevertheless, you and I know, once you publish something, once you put something out there, it's exposed to everybody, whether you like it or not. In this book, The Guide for the Perplexed, the Rambam covers all kinds of subjects, particularly anthropomorphism, right? the description of God in physical terms in one way or another. Right? Not only you know, the, 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 the grossly anthropomorphic, like God is a hand or something like that, but even, as I said the other day, the, the idea that God um, has emotions or goes places doesn't say that God came down to earth to do something or other, you know. Uh, I'll tell you the truth. I got a uh, letter the other day from a very nice person, a very nice person, who asked me the following question. It's funny they did during this week. How can God be in two places at one time? I mean, you know, I said, you know, welcome to my monies. So um, he deals with questions about God's existence, because after all, as we shall see in a minute, according to Rambam, God does not exist. Now, he exists, but he doesn't exist. So what do you mean by that? Right? Um, so spiritual allegories, because Rambam will say, says this in the Bible this way and that way, and, uh, but it's not literal. But sometimes it is. And by the way, if it's not literal, it's an allegory. If it's an allegory, it has a meaning. What is the meaning? Uh, all these he discusses. Scriptural stories and their details. What exactly happened at the Akedah? Uh, what exactly happened at Maimon Har Sinai? Uh, again, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, he discusses prophecy, uh, which he says is sort of like a certain faculty that is in the human being. You know, that it could be uh, cultivated. It's like going to medical school. You know, if you go in so-and-so many years to medical school, you come out of doctor. If you go in so-and-so many years to prophet school, you ought to come out of prophet, although... As he says, the Torah believes that it's possible even after all the necessary study, God might communicate with you. In other words, the mechanics, as we say today, the physics, can I use that word, of a prophecy, the Tom Meha Mitzvos, what is the reason for the mitzvahs? I didn't say a reason for the mitzvahs, I said the reason for the mitzvahs. All this got him a lot of trouble. And a lot more. A lot more. Now, interestingly, this third book was not successful. What do I mean when I say it was not? Many people don't know what I'm about to tell you. Uh, what does he mean it was not successful? He wrote it for a guy. He wrote it for this student. And he says over there, I hope once you understand these matters, you'll be able to figure out the rest on your own, and these should solve your religious questions. The student did not find his religious problem solved. And he complained about this to Maimonides in a, in a letter which is unbelievably flowery and imaginative. It's rather extraordinary. Hein leve chag we... You and I, he writes to Maimonides, share one language, knows we, we're, we're really tight with each other, and no stranger has ever passed in between us, knows we have a real good relationship. And I always wanted just to, to dwell in the shadow of your friendship. But then he says like this, uh, I have kindness on you. I'd like to hear your defense. Answer me if you can. What was the problem? You introduced me to this beautiful girl. I fell in love with her, and then she cheated on me. Yesterday, You introduced me to this girl named Kima. Kima is the, one of the constellations, the Pleiades. In other words, it's a philosophy, get it? It's philosophy. She introduced me to this beautiful girl named Yafa Naima, 
and she found favor in my eyes. But Tita, it's all uh, very Melissa, they're very uh, alliterative from biblical verses. And I married her, or I did Averson. Uh, those who know a little bit about the mission will know that there's this Averson and the Suan. The marriage is in two parts the betrothal and then the final marriage ceremony. Nowadays they're doing both together. But uh, in those days, you know, and everybody's ever been in Yeshiva for a minute will remember there's three ways of doing Kedusha of Averson, Kesef, Sharbia. They said, I acquired. This girl, through Kesef Sharmbia, be rasti li be amuna kedas the kalocha al harsina in the zuna, be sholosh ele kedash tia. I was a mekadisher. I betrothed her. Knows I united with philosophy. Kesef yedidus lamor in the I spent plenty of money on the lessons. Ushtar avon kosafdiol, and I wrote a star a love letter. That would be the star. Ki avtia bechiv al barusul bal tia. And a DB also, which is, you know, it says Adam and Eve is Das. You know, so he knows I united with philosophy in the most intense personal level. And I wanted to take it to Chuba. Knows I wanted to consummate the marriage, so we should be fully married. Philosophy and me, we should have a happy marriage. I, I, it was a love match. There was no onus from a father. I didn't uh, force her, I didn't seduce her. It was a fair marriage. Like Choshkabi. I loved her and she loved me. He's writing this in a Rambam. Chashaktiho, v'nafshi v'nafshi kshartiho. We were both in love, at least I thought we were. V'chol zeb v'fnei shnei einam burum. And at the wedding of me and philosophy, I had two witnesses, Avicenna and Averroes, <laughs> two main philosophers. Abed Allah, Uben Roshad. Avicenna and Averroes. <laughs> the two philosophers that my mind respects. And then what happened? And right under the chuppah, she was mazana. She was unfaithful to me. In other words, it proved the, 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 the I hoped to unite with her and find answers through this unity with philosophy to the religious problems that are tearing my head. And she betrayed me under the chuppah. So just when I acquired the philosophy, the questions got bigger. Which obviously means that the Martin of Ugham didn't work for him. Uh, and other lovers uh, uh, seduced her because of Moshe Meikim Kad Masa, and as the famous Moshal writers tell us, Chasiv is also to Chupasa. It's pretty bad. That's a chutzpah when a kala uh, commits an adultery under the chuppah. The Masa be able. I didn't do anything wrong. Kirachem lied that she didn't go with me. In other words, the fault does not lie within me. Now you know and I know the Ramos going to write what. You're a loser, the fault lies with you. But I'm telling you what this guy said. Besar me Oli, she ran away from my tent. Omari Noble Arisani, I wasn't able to see a beautiful face. But color Oli Shishmitani, I didn't hear a beautiful voice. I married philosophy and I didn't hear the beautiful face. I didn't see the beautiful face, I hear the beautiful voice. Viatolo Kosisa Bitiko, and you, my mommies, you didn't rebuke your daughter and tell her this is not the way it's supposed to be. Vlechlamto, you didn't embarrass her, taste us of Lechamto. Why? Maybe you're the cause of the trouble. But Gamzu Royal Rabba. And therefore I say to you now, Hoshev Esish Eshes Oishki Nobihu, Oyea, Vespalba Chavachie. As um, God said to Abimelech, return Sarah, the wife, to uh, Abraham, he should pray for you. So I'm saying that to you. Return my wife, philosophy. Who got me Spalba, Adola, Hokino, Sola, Sada, Vim Eno, Mesha, but you don't answer me back. I don't have time to see what Sarah Sarah said. I won't read the whole thing. So it's a very fascinating letter. And not so many people know that the God for Plexal wasn't exactly necessary. Now, let's see the next slide. Good. The Ramam says what? My daughter is beautiful. You're the one who's inadequate. That'll take too long to read. But you can get the general idea. So you have a little bit of a spat over here. So much for guiding the perplexed. Now, in this philosophical book, in concentrated form, and in his earlier writings in more scattered form, Maimonides discussed theological or hashkafa matters of all sorts. Mainly, I would say, concerning the logical consequences of the radical deconstruction of anthropomorphism and the definition of God as that which literally created everything, material, ideational, and everything. In such a theology, there is nothing you can actually say about God. You can't even say God exists. Now, if I understand this correctly, 
It goes like this. Define God. That was created everything. Nothing exists without being created by it. It wasn't created by anything, but everything else was created by it. That's the Jewish definition of God, according to the Ramah. Okay, here we go. Is God good? No, there was a time good didn't exist. God created it, so God can't be good. You can't be something you made. You have an essence other than that. Is God smart? Is God this? Is God that? Is he eternal? No. There was a time eternity didn't exist. In fact, the word eternity didn't exist, let alone the concept of eternity, or the reality of it. You know what I'm saying? But what about before? There was no before. <laughs> God created time. Any word you can think of. Uh, now, I'm really going to play games with you. Does God exist? Well, actually, he created the concept of existence. <laughs> so he can't exist. You're telling me God doesn't exist? God exists, but he didn't exist. And you always say, well, oh, you, you drown me nuts over here. Oh, it's around I'm going to say, back off. This is only for those who can handle these types of questions, you see? Well, the well, average guy said, I guess, God doesn't believe God exists. So what he said, right? Then what he said, so, he's got, so to answer the question of the guy, is God in two places at once? God's not in places. God created space. Is God in heaven? No, God is not in heaven. He created heaven. And so forth and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, so you're telling me now that you, that you have an unknowable God. So the realm will come back and well, you can't say unknowable either. <laughs> right? Incomprehensible God. Well, incomprehensible is also a context. The Arizal in the later centuries took this even to a more extreme. You see, God created the world out of nothing. Okay? Who created nothing? You say, what do you mean by that? Well, think about it. Nothing is an idea. So once upon a time, nothing didn't exist. So you're already like cracking up when you do all this, right? Now, as I said before, saying God doesn't exist might be taken as, as, as a statement of atheism, but actually it's the highest form of Amuna. It's Amuna's Rufa as opposed to Amuna's Fela. Because you say that God is so sublime that there's no attribute, or there's no word that applies to him because he created all the words. To create all the words, they once didn't exist, so he can't be identical with those things. Now, the result is what's going to be coming as a modern controversy in which there's going to be two schools of thought. And each one holds the other side, it's not from. Each one holds the other side, it's not from. The ones who say God exists, and those of you who say God doesn't exist, you're a bunch of atheists, you're not from. To my bodies, they'll say like this No, you dumbbells. When you say God exists, you mean that God is subject to existence. There's God, and there's existence. You want to know whether existence applies to God. So yep, you, you, you are all about his because you believe in two gods, God and existence. You believe in a good God. That means you believe in God and good, because you want to know whether God matches the ideal of good. So there are two gods. There's God, and then there's good, and so on and so forth. So, like that, each was hung past the other. The stage, in other words, my friends, was set for the Maimonidean controversies. Now, obviously... I think you're getting the idea that to do this right, it takes 20 lectures, okay? Uh, you need a college course. But to save time, at the risk of a certain oversimplification, I'm going to run by you tonight a list of 25 criticisms, which I found in the book many years ago, which I now own, written by Joseph Sarachek, who was a conservative rabbi in New York City uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And he wrote a book on my Maimonidean controversy called Faith and Reason. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting book. Of course, from the perspective of a guy with his background. Uh, so it's a golden oldie. Let's go to the next one. If you're into it, there, there it is. And what he did was he collected, and I, like I say, you know, I, I don't agree with every single one, but I'm going to go with the idea that we do. He collected what he would call a bill of indictments of 25 pieces that people had complaints about the Rambo one time or another over things that he said or they thought he said. And I'm going to share them with you right now to give you an idea of the complexity of the Maimonidean controversies. I won't go through each and every one in detail, but I do want to give you this overview. Tonight you're getting an overview of what the problems were. So here we go. 25 criticisms. Let's go. Number one. Uh, this is Sarah Cech now. Maimonides was one of the few Jewish teachers who took the extreme step of studying philosophy for its own sake and seeking consistently to bring a Jewish tradition in accord with it. Well, there's kind of truth to that. The realm of like philosophy because he held that's the truth. Right. Like I say, he was, not, he was nuts over this stuff. Uh, the right kind of philosophy. Not even the methods of certain philosophical gaonim satisfied him because the Kalam, which was, I told you the other day, that's what he considers the loser type of philosophy, the theology. Uh, not even the Kalam was scientific enough. It took too much for granted. Secular studies were not unique before Maimonides. The gaonim were familiar with these. We know, for example, of high-gum new secular studies. 
but metaphysical, and Sadi Gom, of course, metaphysical inquiry. And the use of Maimonides main of it was new when people didn't feel comfortable. This is not what Roshach does in the Pan of Yeshiva, okay? Number two, he incorporated philosophy into, into the code. This is true. If you learn um, the first part of the Ramam's code, uh, it includes uh, natural philosophy or science. He tells you, like I said before, this chapter is about Maise Brachis, which to him is a science course in physics, uh, what matter is created of and what happens when matter disintegrates and things of that nature, the science of those days. Uh, why is that part of Halacha book? You see? Uh, halacha book should tell us the laws and the rituals. What are you throwing this stuff in for? This, to the anti maimonists wrongly emphasized the theoretical side of Judaism instead of the practical and vitiated the great work. And that's true. We'll see they eventually burned that part of the book because they were very offended by the idea of a guy trying to put science... By the way, they weren't wrong. The Rambab is grounding the science and the science of his day. I mean, if you and I had to believe in that, we would have to believe in the science of the 12th century. He rated the advantages gained from intellectual exercise above those of pious living and religious study in the Talmud. If you read the Rambam's works, the study of uh, metaphysics in the right way, the philosophy in the right way, is what gives you immortality. It gives you, so, wait a minute, I thought you're just supposed to be a firm Jew and practice the mitzvahs. And he seemed to be rating, as he says before, the advantages of intellectual exercise above those of pious living and religious study. He denounced the scholars whose literalism led them to embrace erroneous theological ideas and intellectual astigmatism, be a waste of time to convince them by argument, because they're learning is traditional and not scientific. So there's a certain uh, contempt there as the realms for literalists, you understand? Um, this ticked off a lot of people also. Just to give you one example, maybe we'll talk about it a little later, uh, the Raven, who's much uh, more yeshivish, was a Rosh Hashiva, attacks the realm because the realm says anybody believes that God could have a goof in any form, God could have any kind of body or material form whatsoever, is beyond Judaism as a heretic and all the rest will burn in hell forever. The rabbi said, no, 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 maybe the guy's wrong, okay, granted, a from Jew who practices all the mitzvahs, believes in God, but he's not in the idea of, you know, and he thinks God exists, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or he thinks God likes tzaddikim. Oh, the rabbi said, can't have emotion. That makes him a kofer? That makes him a heretic? That's ridiculous. Let's go to the next one. Criticism number four. He attempted to reveal the mysteries of creation and the chariot, which is Talmud's prohibits. We just talked about that. The Meisim Recover, the Meisim Bracious, which to him have to do with, with metaphysics and theology. Number five, he gave Israel an Aristotelian conception of God, meaning no personality, um, and endeavored to prove his existence from the internal circular motion of the sphere. That's in his philosophy book. That was science in the 12th century. To the pious Israelites, no proofs in essay. Tell us, what are you doing trying to prove the existence of God? So, so, so one person looks like, oh, very good. You know, We have, uh, like I said the other day, we have speakers go around to the schools to try to prove this and try to prove that. But a firm school like this, oh, it's, it's not subject to proof. Okay? To the pious Israelites, no proofs are necessary. God's existence is as axiomatic as 2 plus 2, but the sun gives light. What are you going over this Kakira business? They consider very unfirm. Number six, under the influence of Aristotle's ideas of God, Maimonides made the doctrine of incorporeality, no form, and termed the disbeliever heretic. That's what I was talking about. Ignorance, ignoring the literalism of Scripture, he states there is no excuse for upholding the view of corporeality. There is no excuse? You expect every guy, every woman, every kid, and all the rest of it. There's no excuse if they think that God has, like I say, a personality or something like that. There's no excuse, and that person's going to burn in hell. The literal view is inbred in the people from early youth, hence their difficulty in receiving a broader conception, the doctrine of incorporeality, as that of God's existence, must not wait for logical demonstration before it can be popularly accepted. This is the Almohad business. You have to teach and force this down everybody's throats. Elo to Musagovi, Elo Goof, even from a young age, and anyone who deviates it is a big sinner. It must be taught to everyone, old and young men and women. Other teachings, however, such as relate to attributes, pro uh, prophecy, Providence and free will are to assist rate toward the secrets of the law restricted to qualified persons. This view of Maimonides was not welcome in his day among his opponents of later centuries because the God does speak, the Bible speaks of God corporally. And one should have the right to believe in him in this manner. I don't say it's true, but you have the right knows if somebody thinks that way, it doesn't make him a, a heretic. 
Furthermore, Judaism centers around three or four embracing principles. This is Indominianism, I told you before. And within certain limits, freedom is allowed the individual to take in his own way. And why are you saying that anyone who deviates from what you consider the philosophically proven truth is a heretic, which has strong consequences? Let's go to the next one. And denying to God attributes which Scripture clearly ascribes to him, because as I said before, the Torah says God is God al-Giber Vanor, Ela God al-Giber Vanor, for example. Well, by the time the Ramah's finished, you can't say he's Godel, can't say he's Gibber, can't say he's Nero, because he created Godel, he created the word and concept of Gibber, he created the word, you, know, you understand? And so, uh, but the Torah uses that language, that my mind is acting on the ground that they negate his incorporeality and, and unity. Even such essential process properties as existence, life, power, wisdom, and will cannot be referred to God. I told you before, God created existence, so you can't say God exists. Number eight, God is separate from the universe and not in any contact with it whatsoever. Uh, I don't know about if he's right about this. I don't know if the Ramah holds that way. The religious philosophy is transcendental, being was the only true reality. The Orthodox couldn't conceive of such a God. That was not so schlock. Let's go to the next one. After defining the nature of God, he devotes considerable efforts to the question of the world's origin. God was so alone. Okay? Did God create everything out of nothing, or did he create it out of stuff that was already there? The first line of scripture said that the world was created. Gracious bro, he must have my arts. Tradition declared a man creation from nothing. Yesh me'ayin, from nothing. The Rambam loudly professes this view, but he provoked the people in the God for the perplexed by saying that he would have rejected the Jewish teaching of creation if Aristotle had successfully proved the theory of, of the world's eternity. He says those words. He says, as it happens, Aristotle wasn't able to, to prove it, and so I'm going to go with the Torah says. That's why you say it's yesh mi'ayin? His refusal to accept the multi-column uh, proof of divine existence, the Muslim theologians, is based on the fact that creation is a debatable problem. For he says if the philosophical view of eternity is correct, the existence of God becomes uncertain. Well, can you imagine somebody reading this? I know what he means, but I know I, I can imagine how you take this out, right? Some scholars saw in the regarding painted Aristotelian view a certain insincerity or equivocation of the Jewish idea of creation, which is usually yesh me'ayin, done. There was nothing, and there was something. Okay? Maimonides raised the doubt in some people as to his view of miracle. Did he, did he believe in miracles? Which he did, but you'll see. He contended as good as to telling that the laws of nature are supreme and immutable, and even God cannot interpose himself in the cosmos to alter the course. It, not he can't, he doesn't. Okay? As for the miracles... He escaped the difficulty by assuming that when God created the world, he predetermined what changes in nature should happen, and traditionalists maintained that God can do whatever he wants. So, in other words, the philosophical ways, and by the way, it's in the Chazal, philosophical ways to say, for, ex for example, the talking donkey was created before uh, in the six days of creation. That's what it's meant, uh, and uh, other miracles. Why do you say that? If it was built into the Bria, then it didn't involve the change in nature, because once the first week was over of creation, no changes in nature. So he takes it the Aristotelians will say there are no ever supernatural changes. The Rambab is not like that, but he's, you know, what's the right word? Restrained when it comes to Nisim, as opposed to regular from Jewish, Nisim are gloom all the time. I mean, imagine a chassid, not to make fun of it, imagine a chassid saying, my rabbi can do this, that, and the other, and it has. He cured people and the other, and so then you have no, definitely no problem about God doing it or Moshe Rabbeinu. So why are you bringing up this uh, philosophical business? His theory of providence, which is Hashkocha, was open to attack because he made his action dependent on a person's intellectual association with active reason. Active reason was the active intellect. These are ideas that were scientific once and are not today. Basically, the active intellect, if I understand it correctly, goes like this. There's you and your soul, right? Because you have a life force animating you, animating you. So what happens when you die? Your body goes back to uh, the ground. Uh, to offer, uh, uh, offer vapor. We see that. What happens to the soul? It goes into the active intellect. You see? It goes back into the repository and this kind of stuff. And so, providence depends on how much, while you're in the world, you developed, you cultivated your intellect so it can survive and form the active intellect. Now, maybe I'm confusing you, but you get the idea. The more philosophical a person, the more divine protection he enjoys. Here he's talking about Hashkochem, if God intervenes to help you out. Avram was in trouble and God helped him, right? What about me? I'm not Avram. God's not going to help me. I'm, I'm left in chance. That kind of idea. Hashkocha. Cholos versus Hashkocha. Pratis. 
And the Orthodox re resented this as a blow against the Torah, which the pious, honest, and humble life is held to be desired above all else and deserving of the highest reward. So again, you go back to the idea, who does God want more? The one who um, cultivates his philosophical mind and uh, has high and very abstract and logical thoughts? Or I live in, you know, the person who goes out and, and helps the poor and the leper colony and the lady that, you know, uh, struggles to raise a family. Like we say, the, 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 the for me, you know, your, your Bobby's Bobby, you know. Why does she not get the highest reward? Okay? The authority of the Bible suffered most from his reliance on philosophy, for every philosopher is a rationalist, and Maimonides rationalized the Bible from two motives. First of all, he had another criterion of truth beside revelation. So in other words, it's got to make sense from the, from the uh, philosophical point of view. And secondly, we wanted to make the Bible agree with the formulated Greek philosophy. So he taught us the first step that scripture must not be taken literally. I want to repeat, it's not exactly true. Sometimes he takes it literally. Sometimes he does not. That is how big fights broke out 100 years after his death. Uh, and he criticized preachers who think that wisdom can, consists of knowing the meaning of words. That's in the, in the uh, Akdam of the Perichelic where he says, the problem is these people read these uh, Midrashim or Agathos, they take them literally, and, they, and the problem is they preach it to the others, so they're sharing their ignorance with them. Okay? The dilemma of choosing the alternatives of literalism, let's go to the next one, or the metaphorical method, literal or metaphorical, confronts only the person who combines, you know, traditional and universal, in those English and Hebrew. The simple person need not concern himself with rationalistic exegesis. He also treated the Torah as ordinary legislation. Nemus Medini, and seemed to belittle the supernatural purpose and origin. So the Rambo would say, why does it say, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal? Well, it's a social contract. Can a society steal and kill? Really? That's why God Almighty said all these sublime words? Yeah. In fact, most of them, this is in the Torah, if you learn Vuchim anyway, they're there to organize society, put it on a good level. That lowers its uh, Kedusha level. You understand? I mean, the United States of America has good laws also uh, to help society in the social contract, you know, and uh, people to get along with each other. Uh, uh, this was... Uh, Kashras, for example, is, oh, you know, stay away from bad food. Well, we have the Department of Agriculture. We don't, we don't have to worry about that. By stressing certain practical lens of the Torah, bodily health, social justice, inculcation of the correct opinion, traveled a long way from the traditional concept that the Torah is a mystic bond, O.C. ben you ben between God and Israel. You know it's trivialized the mitzvahs. Uh, this interpretation of Sinaitic revelation, that criticism, now here, if you ask the Rambam, what happened to the Maimon Hasinah, when the term was given, I say this is not simple. Because, according to the Rambab, you can't become a prophet until you reach a certain level. And you have to go through all kinds of um, training, exercise, education. The Jewish people, seven weeks out of Egypt, weren't holding on that level. So, yet they says that they had a revelation in the Harsinai, but they weren't holding the able to understand it. And so, how could this be? And the Rambab, Famously and controversially, he says, well, the people didn't reach the prophetic level which would fit them for reception of the commandments. Well, they said they did. And they heard only a voice Moses heard articulated sounds. So according to Ram and Avodah Bukhim, what happened to Harsinai was, when God said the different commandments, they heard like this, and only Moshe heard the, the words. Really? And that the voice did not emanate directly from God was an instrument created for that purpose. That already makes sense. God is not of a voice box. So he created a voice. That can hear. Right? But the other parts that they weren't, that they didn't experience anything, they didn't know what they were hearing, only Moses heard stuff, that's weird. Or at least most people held it's weird. My mind is held that Moses heard articulate physical speech coming from a, a voice. It didn't believe that sort of communion of Moses' spirit and divine mind took place. He asserted, if scripture did not teach that Moses heard a voice speaking to him, I would accept the latter interpretation. So basically he trivialized, or seemed to trivialize, Shavuos, the Maimon Hasina. The traditionalists were troubled by his ambiguous uh, explanation of the term prophecy, which I told you before. It's like medical school. If you reach a certain level, you get prophecy, which made it seem one thing in the case of Moshe Rabbeinu, another one in the case of the prophets. That's not controversial. Everybody holds from that. The Moshe was in a higher level. Connected with this was the view that prophecy was a natural faculty. Ah, so that ain't got from the Greeks. That, you know, you have it within you, a normal person. 
not someone with a handicap, not some, you know, a normal person has with them the ability to reason, but you have to cultivate other, to use RE capital terms, you have to first train yourself in meditation, and then Kedusha, and you will yourself level to level, and you and I can be prophets, okay? Depend only for the greater part upon a person's developed powers rather than the arbitrary selection of God. It's not exactly true what you think here, because Ramla holds that God has to pick you. But anyway, he was inclined to minimize the importance of the miracles that are prophets. Right? Let's go to the next one. He denied that angels were corporeal beings, regarding them as identical with the intelligences of Aristotle. The realm has a long section on angels, and he helped us, he said that Torah. Only he, he said there are ten types of angels. But he don't mean angels like you think flying around, you know, with wings. This is a severe blow to the prevalent angelology and mystical and traditional circles. 16. He taught that all scriptural stories which angels appear to act or, uh, appear or speak are dreams or visions. Whoa! This week, no, last week was Parshish Bog. In Parshish Bog, Bilaam has an encounter with a talking donkey. But he does it with an angel, the Mal Hashem. Oh, well, if it's an angel, it didn't happen. It was a dream. Now, it happened in the prophetic sense. It's not a fantasy. It happened in a in, in, in the sense that he had this prophecy, but it didn't happen physically. Physically, there's no talking donkey. It's not that he doesn't believe in talking donkey because it's not possible for a donkey to talk. God can do it if he wants to. But if it's anything involving an angel, uh, nobody except Moshe Rabbeinu uh, communicate with angels. Not when they're awake, you know, in, in the regular sense. So when Avram Avinu sees the three angels, the Ram said it was a dream. I repeat, it's a prophetic dream. It's not some fantasy dream. When Yaakov wrestles with an angel, it's a dream. It's a prophetic dream. It says has profound significance, but it didn't physically happen, you see? Uh, so he says, Angels connect with Abraham, Jacob, Bilaam are not actual occurrences. In the minds of the many, this affected the authenticity of the biblical history. 17. Maimonides' concept of the soul was different than traditionalists, because Aristotle says there are five parts of the soul. According to him, the soul present birth is only a faculty which vanishes at death. Only one chalik of the soul, the part you cultivated. Let me use the word IQ. That's not what he means, Let's, but I'm going to use it. It's easy to understand. Suppose a person reaches IQ level of 150, in life. Well, then that's how much uh, immortality you have. Suppose the person reaches 200, right? That's how much immortality you have. Suppose the person reaches the level in their life of 20. <laughs> that's how much you have. You see? The real immortal soul is the intellect, which becomes united through knowledge with the active universal intellect. And knows the chalik of the soul. Tell this to regular Jews. And what are you talking about? His quest for an immediate the mistress. Precepts were ineffectual. And from that each one had a reason. Uh, I emphasize the word, a oh, reason. So if you know a oh, reason, and we'll get to this uh, next time, you killed the mitzvah. He applied a sort of comparative research method in explaining such concepts as the sacrificial cult of wearing a wool linen and the planting of mixed seed, wearing disguised loaves and using of incense. According to Rama, why you have so much, uh, what's the reason behind the incense in the temple? Well, the, 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 the meat smells. <laughs> Uh, what's the reason for um, shotness? Well, the, the priests in Egypt used to wear that, so we're anti-Egyptian priestology. Really? What's the reason for carbonus? Well, people at that time were superstitious, so you had to give a religion of all carbonus. Really? Okay? His view to certain foods are prohibited because of their wholesomeness turned the Orthodox against them. Because, let's face it, uh, ham is unhealthy. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> See? Uh, the opposition of my mind is for assigning reasons emanate from two classes of people, those who object in principle because they want Talmudic view that the laws are the arbitrary wishes of an absolute wise God and don't speculate on their reason. Notice God has, I, I don't want to use this term, but I will, infinite intelligence. The wrong moment should be. Infinite intelligence. For infinite intelligence, you can't understand the reason why. Those who, like Nachmanis and the mystics, were displeased with the historical and social reasons because the mystics will say they're Kabbalistic reasons, not the one that you offered. He taught that the permanent life in the world would come be spirit, spiritual, not physical. We'll deal with this in a little bit. Well, the sum and bun, the highest goal in the end, is, is attainable by enlightened people of every religion and nothing particularly Jewish in it. And his conception of the after, I'll, I'll deal with this a little bit later. In his commentary on the mission and, 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 the, and the mission of the Torah, he treated resurrection very meagerly. Again, I'll deal with this more later. There are, uh, uh, what, what happens to you in the end? Do you survive just as a soul? Do you actually come back as a physical person? Let's go to the next one. 
He held that the Medrash and Agadatah were not intended to be taken literally, but to teach him in Berisha a, a text of the Bible. This is not unique to the Ram at all. Okay? And he doesn't hold, I want to be clear about this, contrary to what they say in these books, the Ram does say every Medrash is not literal. Some are, but some are not. Okay? Same thing, stories in the Bible. Some are literal, some are not. There will be people later on who will say we follow his footsteps, we don't believe any of it's literal, but that's what the Ram said. The question becomes very important because Jews are forced to take a definite stand towards the authority of the Agatha on account of polemical disputations. He means that when the Ramban was challenged by Paulo Christianity, they got through a bunch of Midrashim at him. You see? Uh, let's go to the next one. He departed from the customary thought in denouncing astrology. The Gemara is full of astrology. The Ramo says astrology is baloney, it's bupkis. He says the first subject I studied when I was a kid and mastered it, and it's a bunch of baloney. Zero. Okay? He denied the existence of Shadim. He formulated a creed having debatable philosophical principles and laying unconventional stress on certain collective beliefs. Who gave you the right to say that Judaism consists of 13 principles? If you don't hear teaching every one of them, you're a bad Jew. Who appointed you God? It's not the Torah. Where'd you get this idea from? Okay? And why, how do you pick the ones you pick? The establishment of a creed was not Jewish. It had a Mohammedan flavor. You know, it sounds like he, he picked it up from the Arabs. There's certain things you have to believe in. It's a violation of nomianism, as I said before, okay? People raise the question, did Maimonides write a maximum or a minimum creed? That's the famous Kasha. Wait a minute. You have to believe in Theus Mason. You have to believe in, uh, I don't know where this got there. You know, Brias uh, Olam. Do you have to believe in Shatnas? A firm jewel say like this. Do you, do you have to believe in Lovan? Lovan existed? I mean, I think we have everything in the Torah, you see? So who did you pick these things for? And finally, the last of them, his Book of Laws and Mission of Torah, upset the scholars, regardless of the merits of the code, considered to be a work of genius and short givings, you know, shortcomings, and we talked about it last time, for which the author was not forgiven. A, he didn't include the sources or footnotes. B, he didn't include the, the names of the Talmudic authors. Then he omitted the dissenting points of view. He only gives you the bottom line. And finally, he established the law beyond appeal and aspired that his work should supplant the Talmud. Now, that's not really what I meant, but that's how it was taken, because he said, all you need is my book and the Chomish, and you're on your own. You don't need anything else. So it sounds like he was trying to knock out the Gemara. Right or wrong, and with a quibble or two, these are broadly correct. And it gives you at least an idea, even if you don't understand everything I just said, because I ran through it pretty quickly. Um, but even, you know, it gives you an idea of the broad nature of the problems that his variegated writings led among people. And if the Rambam hadn't been a great person, people would say, eh, big deal, who cares what he said? He clearly was not an idiot. He clearly was a guttle. He clearly was a guttle ador. Then it really bothered them that someone who clearly was a guttle ador is saying things that sound trait or sound funny, even though the average person out there couldn't exactly tell you why he sound funny because they weren't so educated. Now, during the lifetime of Maimonides, his reputation grew and grew over the years for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, he was an important rabbi, and he wouldn't take a salary. That's an important sheet of his. He won't take a penny. That way, he has more integrity. That is true. Right? That's why he was a doctor. It is true. If I don't take a, and before that, he relied on his brother. If I don't take a penny for you, then I'm not worried about what you're going to do to me, okay? He didn't need a, a raise, as it were. Second of all, Duram uh, has a long essay on the importance of not taking money. Uh, in his uh, uh, Pierce on Pierce uh, Secondly, the guy who held him, you know, the Ibn Ezra says, why did God arrange it that Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest Jew ever, should be raised in a Pharaoh's palace and have a public school education, shall we say? And he went to boys' hieroglyphics. Why, why, why was that? Shouldn't, shouldn't Moshe Rabbeinu have been born in Ben Brock and learned in the Panavish Cheder and so on and so forth? And the Ibn Ezra gives a number of reasons. One of the reasons is the Jewish people would, it's like Rodney Dangerfield, they give no respect, right, if he just had a Jewish background. If he had a PhD from the Goyim, that's a different story, right? So Moses was a prince of Egypt, so they give him respect, uh, which is an interesting commentary to Pirkei Elvis, I mean, of the Ibn Ezra. Same thing with the Rambo. They say like this, the guy's the doctor of the, the prime minister, of the new king. Uh, the people read his medical books. Whoa! So the... The, the creds he had among the non-Jews gave him a lot of creds with the Jews. Um, and I might say that these claims held of him 
as a real MD and a philosopher. I told you, Rambam belonged to one or two discussion clubs, both societies, where they talked over philosophical questions. We have Islamic sources on this. Um, so what I'm trying to say is like this. What other Rishon was a player in the world? Rashi, Tosis, Rajma, Ritva, Ramban, and all that. They're rabbis. They're important people in the Jewish community. They're great scholars. Which one was Chashev as an intellectual and a thinker in the non-Jewish world, in the broad universal world? Only Maimonides, at least that I can think of. Besides his Jewish knowledge, he was considered a major MD. Besides his Jewish knowledge, he was considered a major philosopher. Um, totally independent of his Jewish stuff. Uh, that gave him incredible stature. I'll say it again. Who do we know? Tell me a rabbi today, a great scholar, I can't think of any, who's a, a player out there in the world. Uh, rabbi Salvation was a, a, a gone and knew a lot in secular as well as Jewish. He wasn't a major figure in, um, in the international philosophical community or something like that, you see? But the Rambam was in his day. I'll say it again. There's no other Risham that's like him. And he was financially honest. You know, all they tried to dig up dirt on him, they could find nothing on him. Because the guy was actually took it seriously. He shall not steal. And second of all, or rather I should say fourth, he was not a turnoff because he deliberately conducted himself in a certain way that he regards as necessary Hanukkah, which includes being nice to people. Because he could have been a snooty guy who looked down and said, you all don't know nothing compared to me, which was true. But what does the Ramam say so famously, where he says, a scholar must be exemplary in his interpersonal conduct. He writes in Hilda Sisei Torah. There are certain things that involve Achil Hashem, and they don't mean what you think it means. But rather it means Achil Hashem, as we would call today, a firm scandal. Who shiyasa adam gadol b'tar m'forsim achasidus, if a person is considered a great Tamil Chachim and very from, and it gets on the internet. He does things that people uh, speak uh, behind his back against him. No, there's something scandalous. I'll be shaken up here, and it might not be necessarily something that's a sin. Hamachal says Hashem is unworthy conduct. And he gives several examples from the Gemara. If he goes to the store and doesn't pay on time, even if he pays later, it might look like he's not paying on time. That's the Gemara Yuma. He's taking advantage of being a rabbi, he doesn't pay. Not that it's true, but it looks like that. Or he's undignified, he laughs a lot in public. He eats in public uh, restaurants where everybody looks like a fresser. He doesn't talk nicely to people, he barks at them. And the commentator in front of the office, if people approach him, he looks at them very coldly, doesn't greet them with a smile. Okay? He's not nice. I mean, I know why he's that, because he's so smart. But if he does that, El Balkatata Bakas, he's always angry, he creates quarrels. The bigger you are, as a rabbi, as a scholar, the more you have to go beyond the letter of the law, not to violate these things, but to be extra nicey nice. Now listen to this. If a Chacham is very careful about himself, he always talks nicely to people. He does walk around like some stuck-up prig. He's nice. He, he can mix with people. He smiles. He does return insults. He gives cover to people even though they're beneath him. He's absolutely honest in business. She wasn't done her hang around bull sessions. Whenever you see him, he's learning. He always conducts himself more than necessary. But not weird. He's not, you know, to the point he's a hermit and a, and a, and a super from nut. Okay? Below Yishloma, people shouldn't be, look like, like he's a nut. And therefore he makes himself very popular. People like to be around him. He's a turn on. They want to imitate him. Hari is a kiddush Hashem. That's a kiddush Hashem, right? So the Rambam, as far as I know, 
Um, and that's the possible, by the way, the e You have to make the name of God below it, but you can only do it by your conduct. So, uh, as far as I know, the way it's described in the few letters and encounters that we've found in the Guineas elsewhere, the Ramah was like that. So people who's a great scholar is a nice guy. And finally, I mean, fifth, even if you held that he made a few mistakes here and there in the mission of Torah, it could be. Like the Ravid, you know, once in a while, the Ravid says the Ravid's wrong here and there. Yeah. Say what you want. The guy was holding in God's shots. You know, if you tell me to make a mistake here, a mistake, uh, uh, stipulating that, because he, he might not be wrong. But let's say he made a mistake here, a mistake there. I mean, come on. The guy is at least a God of Lador. Nobody can write the mission of Torah, right? Without knowing everything, even if he doesn't get everything exactly right. So this made his reputation grow and grow. The fact that his reputation grew and grew did not prevent personal attacks on him. Such is the nature of Machlokas in the yeshiva cervicals of Baghdad, and that was the B'nai Brak of that time. His reputation did not matter. Instead, you have it there, Shmuel ben Eli, who was a Gaon. Now, Baghdad was the capital of the Arab Empire until the Arab Empire fell apart. By the time of the Ram, the Arab Empire had fallen apart. Uh, and once upon a time, Baghdad was ahead of the, the two great yeshivas, they were the leading centers of Talmudic studies in the world. And the people in charge of Yeshiva was going to have international authority. But then it all fell apart. Whereas the Arab Empire fell apart. Uh, and instead, new centers of Torah scholarship arose in, in the West, uh, w- which is where the Rambam came from. There was an attempt in the Rambam's lifetime, in the 12th century, to revive the Gaonic Yeshiva and the, and the glory in Baghdad. They made an attempt. There was a guy, Shemul ben Eli, who was rich, and he built a big Yeshiva with hundreds of guys. And he was chashim, he got involved with the government. He had a lot of power and authority. It looked like he was restoring the glory of the Gonic era. He had a daughter, by the way, who was a Tanakh expert, and she used to give shirim in the yeshiva, um, behind, sitting behind the screen in Tanakh. The famous um, traveler, Pesachi of Regensburg, he was like Benjamin, he was like the Jewish Marco Polo. You know, there's like five or ten Jewish Marco Polos. Like Benjamin Tudel, you've heard of. It's one of the Pesachi of Regensburg. He goes... To Baghdad, he said, well, she's giving the class, I think it was in Tanakh, uh, but she's sitting behind the screen, you know. Uh, so the guy was cool, but I'll use Baghdad to represent these circles. They disliked the Ramam personally because he was the poster child of post gaonism which was a new unpalatable reality because you can't revive the once unchallenged sway of the Gaonic Yeshivas. By the 12th century, the co- clock could not be turned back to the Kufat HaGaonim. Now, the other Shonim, lived far away, and they always used deferential rhetoric vis-a-vis the Gonin, especially in Spain. Uh, so, you know, it's, oh, you guys are great, and we send you money, all the rest of it, even though they ran the show in, in France and Spain their own way. By contrast, the Rambam had moved to the Middle East, cultivated a network of fans, and was not deferential to the Gonin, not really. He held that his rabbis, the Spanish Rishonim, were in no way inferior to the Gonin, Moreover, the current Gonim, the current Gonim, his time, in private letters, he considers them losers. He wouldn't say so publicly, but it was evident. So therefore, you have the bad blood and the predisposition of Baghdad to scrutinize the writings of Maimonides to find faults. Now, since his mystique lay precisely, his mystique lay in being a paragon of Torah knowledge and secular knowledge, Baghdad was predisposed to ferret out any kfira, any heresy, they could discover. I emphasize Kfira because I'm not talking about arguments against this halachic rulings like I told you the other day he had a fight about whether he can go to the river not on Shabbos. That's a halachic argument. Now here we go. Baghdad scrutinized the various writings and concluded that the Rambam did not believe in Chiyas and the physical resurrection. If you're righteous and you die, you go to heaven, done. Now they were quite aware that the Rambam himself in his Mishnah commentary had included Chiyas as one of the 13 principles of Judaism. Those, anybody who doesn't subscribe to that, even the 13 principles, is outside the pale. Nevertheless, everywhere else, whenever he talks about, Chiyas, uh, uh, about life after death, he omits Chiyas and instead talks about life after death, in the sense of immortality of soul. So what are we arguing over here? To you and I, it probably doesn't even matter that much. <laughs> what happens when you die? Are you going to come back one day, like I am now, in a physical goof, or are you going to just live on in bliss and paradise? Now, from the Rama's perspective, he's going to have to deal with this from a philosoph- I shouldn't say the Rama's perspective, I should say from a philosophical perspective. What do you need to come back for? Right? 
may strike some people as radical, but you probably didn't think about it. Let's say your father and mother in heaven. So you'll go there and you'll hang around with however they do that in heaven in some immaterial form. Why do you have to come back on earth and be in physical groups to see each other again? Do you, do you get my point? What's the necessity of that? The real schar is in the, the ruchnias. Okay? So, um, let's go to the next one. There was a text. Next one. Where's physical resurrection? Uh, look at the, the second paragraph. All you have is in, in the nefesh. It's like angels. Right? And there's no eating and drinking. It's a purely spiritual existence. Right? Now, Basically, therefore, the yeshivas in Baghdad, yeshiva circles in Baghdad, were accusing Maimonides of being hypocritical bull artists. The dumb masses, you tell you have to believe in physical resurrection. But you yourself do not. Now, Rambam was angry about this. To defend himself, when he was 53 years old, in 1191, he wrote and published a, a, an essay on resurrection. Here he says something unusual. Listen closely. You live, you die, you come back, and then you die again. And you don't come back. But you live in spiritual bliss. It's a little bit weird. So again, take a great... Uh, I'm going to just give an example. Take a great side. Uh, Rashi. I would say Rashi was a from God. So Rashi died. Eventually he's going to come back. And, and we'll see Rashi. And uh, he was 66 when he died. Well, he'll look better. And I'm serious. And live a long time. And we'll have the benefit of seeing Rashi like that, physically. But eventually he will die and live in heaven in, in, in bliss. In, in, which is a better existence than living a nice physical existence here. I think everybody can understand that. So that's, you know, that really threw everybody for a loop. Now this was written, and you understand why. Because it doesn't make any sense for people should live on physically. A Ruchni is a Kiyum, Ruchni's thinking experience is a better for you, right? It's better for you. So why do you want the physical? Then this letter was written in Arabic, but soon was translated into Hebrew. That's when the trouble started. Maimonides lived... I'm going to set this up for next time. The Rambam lived in Cairo, happy to have escaped persecution in Andalusia and Muslim Spain which was now empty of Jews, because they either killed or chased the Jews out of force and convert. But by this time, when he was an older man in the late 1100s, Ram was born in 1138, I'm talking about now like 1190s, and early 1200s, two things happened in Spain or Iberia, which affected the Jews. Here's the map. When the Ram was still alive in his old age, the Christians are gaining ground. The red is the Christians. Right? Instead of being a little piece at the top, now they're more than 50%, well over 50%. Okay? Uh, Castile, Aragon, and so forth. So first of all, the physical, political situation was changing in Spain. The Christians were beating the Muslims. And number two, important Jewish communities that formed in Christian Spain. Let's go next one. You can see Toledo, for example. Right? Toledo and the Barcelona and places like that. These in Christian Spain. Uh, they became important centers of Jewish uh, um, uh, population and important centers of Jewish intellectuality, including Torah intellectuality. Okay? So, Spain looked different in the Ramadan's old age than it did when he was young. This is not Christian Spain I talk about, not Muslim Spain. We're not interested in the bottom part, there's no Jews here. Now, hold that thought. You see, from now on in this series, the Maimonidean controversies are going to take place in three places, mainly in two. Number one, Christian Spain. Number two, Provence and Languedoc. That's here. That's in France, which is next door to Spain. Spain is the country below it, right? I think you know that, hopefully. So what you see there is southern France today, but that time was its own country called Provence and Languedoc. Uh, this is a cluster of small but important Jewish communities. Okay. That's another place, in fact, that's the main place that the Maimonian controversies will rage. And C... The third place is good old Ashkenaz. We talked about long ago with the Yiddish. There's France in 1180. The upper half of France is Ashkenaz. That's where Rashi lived, Tosas lived, and all the other guys. Now, 
the Rambam is living in the time of the Balitosis. He didn't know about them as far as we know, but they were going on. Cultural conditions, notice the conditions of Jewish culture were quite different than they had been in Andalusia and Islamic Spain when the Jews had lived there. What is the nature of the Jewish culture in these places? It's very interesting. Now you have to hold cup on maybe another minute or two because this is going to say, lay the, uh, the background for what happens in the future. In northern France, which you see over here, is what we call Torah only. Right? That's what I call Tozen's land. Cultural insularity at its peak. These guys were only interested in learning Gamar, 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 and they loved it. Now, in Christian Spain, you had, now listen closely, Torah plus college, but college strictly for Parnassa. And so they were familiar with secular studies, some were doctors, but they're not Mashiach secular studies. A little bit like near Israel studies, it's not something like that. Right? They're not Mashiach, especially vis a vis Torah. I mean, it's a Catholic environment, maybe that contributed to it. So these people study Aristotle, all the rest of it. But they would never do what the Rambam does, which is trying to miss that with that. This is what I studied for college, you know, to know the science stuff. But it's not anywhere. You, you compartmentalize it. You, you don't mess it with the Torah. The Torah says this, and then Aristotle's full of baloney. And then you had Provence, which is a variegated group. Interesting group. Provence is again at the bottom over there. You had in Provence some Torah-only guys, the Rivet, who's the famous critic of the Rambam, was like that. The Rivet was a multimillionaire. Uh, he had a, little, a, a big yeshiva, actually. He could afford it. It was real for me. And it's Gamar, Gamar, Gamar. They liked it that way. Married into a rich family. Then you had another type of Torah scholars. Big ones, too. But they were also interested not just in Gamar, 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 but also in Jewish culture. Jewish culture. These were well-to-do scholars. So it's an interesting group, this uh, uh, Provence. You had some Rabbanim who were millionaires, the equivalent of that. Uh, big libraries, they knew how to learn very well. Uh, but they're also interested in other things as well. And they heard always about the Jewish scholarship in Spain and in the Arab world, but they couldn't read Arabic, so they were always wondering about it. Right? And so these scholars in the lifetime around them started what we would call a translation movement. Okay? And so they hired people to translate the classics of the Sephardim and the Arab Jews into Ivrit. Sadigon is a Mursudeya, Sadigon wrote this in Arabic. In the 900s, now in the 1100s, it's translated in Hebrew. The Chobos Abob is the same thing. Chobos Abob was written in Spain in the 1000s in Arabic. Now it's translated in Provence in Hebrew. The Kuzari, for crying out loud, is written in Arabic, but now it's translated into Provence in Hebrew. And the, and the Sefer Shurashim, that's the, the ultimate dictated book. The main dictated guy in Spain wrote dictated books in Arabic. I repeat, he wrote fundamentally important books about the grammar of the Hebrew language, Lush and Kodesh, in Arabic. And now these guys have a translator. Why? Because these guys are rich and they can afford to pay a guy to translate them. That's how these, these are the original translations of these classics of Judaism. Otherwise, people would never have known about them because very few people could read Arabic outside the Arabic world. Okay? How did he do this? They found a guy who needed money, who was a talented translator. Let's go to the next one. There's a... <laughs> if you go to Spain... And I've been there. One of the interesting things they do is the Spanish put up here and there statues. That's a Catholic country. A famous rabbi. There's a statue of the Rambam. In Cordoba, if you see it, uh, the Rambam would freak out because he's against statues. Whatever. There's statues of Shalom Ibn Gaviro and some other poets. Here's one, obviously in front of a, a restaurant in Granada, of Ibn Tibbin. You Ibn Tibbin. Ibn Tibbin is the name of a family we will come across in which they made their money by translating from Arabic to Hebrew. The original guy was from Spain. He ran away from persecution and went to Provence. They said, oh, you know Arabic, you know Hebrew, so we'll pay you. That's how he made a living. Now, his son will translate to Marnabuchim, and all hell will break loose. Now, look, there's nothing traif or controversial in Sadigon, in Chobz al and the Kuzri, right? Now, again, I repeat, these were serious Hamidah Chachamim, mainly into Gemara Gemara, but also interested in other aspects of Jewish culture, like medieval Jewish philosophy. So here we go. I want to make a start tonight. No, it's too late. Actually, I won't. Just make sure you keep these facts in mind, and next time, 
I'll go into the first of these real controversies, which raged in Christian Spain, in Provence and Languedoc, and in northern France. The three most important communities at the time, in terms of Torah scholarship, something the Ramam himself acknowledged, as we shall see. But meanwhile, I'll be quiet and say good night. Until next time. Hmm.